Sir, you can start. So let us wait for a couple of minutes. People are joining. So. Just three minutes. If we can start, sir, the next 31 couple of minutes. Already 50 participants have joined. Yeah. Should we start? People will join in then. Yeah, yes, sir. So, so welcome all. Uh, good evening. And this is our regular every two monthly feature, this neuromuscular subsection webinar. And we request all the top institutes of India to present in this webinar. And this time it's the turn of uh, Nimhans Bangalore Department of Neurology. And we have a very uh, interesting session. The theme today is different facets of neuromuscular junction disorders. And we have two uh, very prominent speakers from the Department of Neurology at uh, Nimhans, Dr. Deepak Menon and Dr. Sina, uh, Dr. Sina Vengalibi. Both are associate uh, professors in the Department of Neurology, Lim Hans. And uh, I think we look forward to a very interesting session next one hour. So I request Dr. Deepak Menon to take over. And uh, please please write your questions in the chat box. And at the end of each, each session, we can take a few questions. Yes, Dr. Deepak. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh and Dr. Vishnu. I'll just uh, start sharing the slides. <laughs> okay, hope my slides are visible. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay great. Okay. Yeah, good evening and welcome once again uh, to this recurring session of the IEN subsection on neuromuscular disorders. Uh, so, this is uh, Neem Han's turn to be the host, playing the host, and we are really proud and happy to be having this chance. So myself, Dr. Deepak Menon, I'm an associate professor in the department. I'm part of the neuromuscular team. Myself and my close friend and colleague, Dr. Sina Vangali, uh, who is also an associate professor, will be um, doing a tag team of sorts. And we'll be going back and forth, presenting a few cases before you, uh, which you hope uh, will find interesting. Unfortunately, our chief and mentor, Dr. Professor Nandali Madam, may not be able to join this time. Um, she sends her regards. Um, we will really miss her inputs and her uh, uh, pearls of wisdom, but uh, she has handpicked these cases and hope uh, you will find these cases interesting. So with this brief intro, I will go to my first case. Um, so it, I'm going to present a case which looked like myasthenia gravis, which sounded like myasthenia gravis, but in turn, it's turned out to be something slightly different. So let's see. So this was a 54-year-old housewife. Um, her chief, chief complaints were uh, she was having progressive breathlessness. Uh, over a period of two years, and then she had worsening lip weakness over a period of one and a half years. She came to us two years into the illness. So her symptoms all started uh, two years back with progressive exertional shortness of breath, um, which as time went by, slowly kept on worsening to such an extent that she started having breathlessness with daily chores even. So initially, she had trouble going to the uh, market around a couple of kilometers away. But then slowly, the distance started getting less and less. And even with mobilizing inside her home, she started having breathlessness. Soon it progressed and slowly her sleep also started getting interrupted. She would have frequent nocturnal awakenings. And uh, she would have a highly unrefreshing sleep where she will be fatigued in the morning and she'll be sleepy during the day. Although there was no history to suggest an orthopnea or an obstructive sleep apnea. So this was, I guess, another clue that something 
was serious was happening. Uh, prominently, she had no other cardiac or uh, respiratory symptoms which would uh, take us uh, on a, down a different line. So she had none of that. She had only these uh, symptoms um, at that point in time. Around uh, six months into the illness, she started having exertional limb weakness as well, initially in the upper limbs. While she was at her chores and in the kitchen, she had trouble reaching overhead, lifting weights, you know, uh, drying clothes, I mean, hanging on the clothes to the clothes line so on and so forth. As time went by, although she had limiting exertional dyspnea, she also started having lower limb weakness, which was, she was very clear that it was over and above her exertion breathlessness because she started having trouble in getting up from low-lying chairs as well as from the bed. And also more and more getting up, uh, going upstairs was getting more and more difficult for her. At times, she also had history suggestive of neck weakness, and her symptoms were such that she was significantly better during the morning hours or after a brief rest and things started getting worse as they progressed and with more and more activity. So there is a credible history of uh, fatigability and fluctuation uh, even at this early part of the illness. Around seven months before presenting to our center, that is around one and a half years into the illness, she was admitted and evaluated elsewhere. By the time her disease had progressed to such an extent that she had limitation of almost all ADL, and she was essentially seated all, almost all of the time uh, due to proximal limb weakness. And she also started having trouble breathing even at rest. She hardly had any significant cranial bulbar symptoms, point to note. Um, uh, she had no trouble, although there was significant deep weakness and significant dif breathing difficulty. She did not have much trouble in speaking or much trouble in chewing or swallowing. Evaluation in that hospital where she was admitted initially showed a clear RNS decrement. Uh, the antibody was negative as per documentation. The CT thorax was normal. And her cardiac workup and respiratory workup found no other uh, end organ damage, which could explain her symptoms. So her breathing kept on worsening, and she finally ended up in the ventilator. She had to be intubated and ventilated because of the respiratory failure. She was started on pyridostigmine. She had a course of plasma exchange. She was given steroids and then escalated to rituximab. The injection dose was given. With all of this, it had a marginal improvement. It was documented that she had some improvement, but uh, patient and family was skeptical. They felt maybe a slight improvement, but not, nothing of note. And then since she could not be weaned off the ventilator, uh, she had a tracheostomy done. And then she was on BiPAP from that point in time onwards. And two years into the illness, she presented to limb hands, needing assistance for all ADL. She was continuously on BiPAP, and she was in a quite miserable condition. And there was no relevant family history. Uh, we read to the history all over again. And there was no relevant family history that she could come up with. So proceeding with the examination, she was very, uh, although she was in quite a lot of distress, she was well uh, oriented and alert. Her higher mental function was normal. There was no sig significant feature to suggest uh, ongoing hypercarbia or hypoxia, at least uh, from neurological perspective. She had a tracheostomy tube in situ and she was on constant BiPAP. We tried taking her of the BiPAP just to see how worse things were and she would immediately have trouble breathing and she had to be connected back to the BiPAP. Uh, she would become tachypneic and the SBC was hardly nothing of note, just four. Her examination, there was no ptosis. Her extra ocular moments were full in all direction. Her papillary, papillary reactions were fairly brisk, nothing of significance. She, however, had a bilateral element facial palsy. The bilateral movements is likely on a sluggish side. Tongue was notably normal. There was no atrophy. And the, the power charting is what I hope you can see here. Almost all the muscles were weak. As you can see, the proximal muscles need to be slightly more affected than the distal muscles. And uh, the fluctuation and fatigue build was quite prominent. She could hardly hold up her arms for a, a period of few seconds. There were no wasting of muscles. There were no fasciculations. There were no UMN signs. The reflexes were well preserved. Uh, sensory and rest of system examination was normal. So to summarize, we had a 54-year-old lady, apparently two-year history of illness, which kept which uh, gradually worsening breathlessness, which was initially with exertion, went on to become even at rest with history sensitivity of hypergarbia. Uh, and she also had progressive fatigable limb weakness, but the prominently cranial bulbar symptoms were absent, autonomic symptoms were not there, she did not have any wasting, and there was no family history. So at this time, maybe I can take a pause or I can go on because we are within time. So I guess we can go on. So possibilities, 
I think most of us would be thinking of a neuromuscular junction tissue disorder. And of course, the theme of today's talk is also NMJ. So I guess neuromuscular junction disorder seem to be on the top of our list. So could it be myasthenia gravis? Looks that way, two year history. But uh, there are some odd points which I will uh, touch up later on, I guess. And could it be LEMS? Because cranial bulbar symptoms are not prominent. I know there are no autonomic symptoms or sensory symptoms. But still, uh, 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 the, uh, the prominently the cranial bulbar symptoms were absent. Signs were also not that prominent. So could it be, are we dealing with the LEMS? Could it be anything else? Do, uh, are we just having one differential diagnosis or are we thinking uh, one diagnosis or are we having a differentials? We always can think of a myopathy because patient, as we saw, started with a significant cardiorespiratory symptoms. So could it be Pompe's? Could it be an inflammatory myopathy? Could it be a metabolic myopathy? And last but not the least, we cannot forget an anterior heart cell disease. Uh, time to time, time to time, we get thrown these curve balls where we see patients having uh, onset as significant diaphragmatic pals. We even recently had a patient who had onset of anterior cell disease or ALS as breathing difficulty. It's not unknown. So could it be an anterior cell disease? Because she never had any uh, remittance of syndrome. Uh, the symptoms were kept on, kept on adding up, and she finally become a BiPAP dependent. So that could be, de be dealing with an anterior cell disease. So these were the possibilities. Maybe we can have generate a few discussion later on as well, time permitting. So proceeding with the investigations, so already, as I mentioned, an RNS was done from outside. Uh, we, of course, repeated the RNS. Uh, before that, the NCS was essentially normal. The CMAP amplitudes were normal. There was no low CMAPs or an improvement with the uh, uh, short exercise. There were no double CMAPs. And as you can see here, there are significant decrement. And you can even see the, if you observe very carefully, you can see the U-shaped recovery towards the end of the simulation. The antibodies we did, uh, again, it was negative. CT thorax was normal, serum, uh, creatinine kinase was normal, ECG and echo was non contributory, the myositis panel was negative, and there was no evidence apparently for a metabolic myopathy. So, but then again, so everything is, seems to be pointing to a zero negative myasthenia gravis. So, but are, is there anything odd? Are we really happy with uh, making a diagnosis of myasthenia? And are we really confident in stepping up the immunosuppression in this case? But what, what are the odd points? Because it seems to be, the course seems to be a bit odd. It's, uh, despite having received a good course of immunosuppressive treatment, patients seem have apparently had no benefit because obviously she went from a ventilator to tracheostomy. I don't think that can be can that can be counted as any kind of improvement. So although the there was some subjective marginal improvement, I don't think so there is any significant improvement. So the relentless course, despite being on a good course of immunosuppressive therapy, speaks uh, volumes. There was no response to pedostigmine or immunomodulators modulus, as I mentioned, and moreover. Patient was continuously on pyridostigmine. Could that be making things worse? So these were the thought process at that time initially when we were working up the patient, and we his reviewed the history. Obviously, we reviewed the history from day one just for dramatic effect. I'm saying it this right now, but we obviously reviewed the history at the time of initial admission itself. And going back, so this now made things more clear. So it's not just a two-year history. So this was a much longer-lasting illness. She was never athletic during childhood. She could never run or play or jump as well as her peers. She was always slightly lagging behind. And her husband of 32 years uh, recollects that she was also not that active. She would use to get fatigued easily with minimal exertion. And she also had some difficulty in climbing stairs. Observers used to mention that she used to push herself off the stair, uh, uh, stairs at times. So with this background, so we now, uh, there's a shift of our diagnostic um, uh, listing. So we were thinking of a myasthenia gravis or an acquired cause. But now that the disease illness is clearly less than what we initially suspected, and the fact that there was hardly any improvement with any immunomodulator therapy, and also to add on to that, could pyridostigmine be a reason for her worsening? So with this background, we did a genetic testing, and lo and behold, we found a compound heterozygous mutation in the called QG. Things moved on rapidly from that point in time. We took her off pyridostigmine. Even before the genetic testing, actually, we took her off pyridostigmine. We started her on fluoxetine and salbutamol. And the improvement was remarkable. Within a period of five to seven days, she got practically off completely off BiPAP. <laughs> and by day 20, she required only three a few hours on BiPAP. And by day 90, she was completely off BiPAP. Tracheostomy was closed and she became independent for all ADL. The improvement was really remarkable. We could see it in front of our eyes, patient improving day by day. I think mostly because she took, we got her off the pyridostigmine, and then the fluoxetine and salbutamol seemed to have worked. 
So I will share a video with uh, the patient's permission. I think we have our permission to record this. This was recorded around five days after hospital admission. By this time, she was significantly better. This was not the patient whom we admitted. She was really sick, on the bed, could not lift her arms, completely dependent on BiPAP. So within a period of five to seven days, you can see how remarkably better she is just by the fact that she, and this is at the end of one month, I believe. She's still, I mean, I, mean, I don't know, I mean, three to four weeks, I, I imagine. So she's off the BiPAP. Uh, tracheostomy is still in situ. You can see how readily she is able to lift her hands overhead, which she never could do in the past uh, one year almost. And she can maintain it for a significant length of time. And she even demonstrated how she can uh, squat on the floor and get up, which she never do, could do in the six months prior to the admission. And somewhere later in time, she how she's, uh, her, uh, she has got her spring back. Literally, uh, she is going up and down stairs without any kind of assistance. And we could get her off tracheostomy. She still, I guess, has a slightly wide battling gait still, but she's much better than how it was, much, much better than how it was uh, a few years back. She readily uh, demonstrated how well she has become. And you can see the uh, coming off the tracheostomy. She is doing a couple of squats for us quite easily. So with this, uh, we see you have seen the history of a story of a remarkable story of a 54-year-old lady, which initially in first glance would think would make us not suspect of an acquired autoimmune myasthenia gravis. But in our careful analysis and careful history taking, we clearly showed that it's obviously not a case of uh, acquired myasthenia gravis, but that of a congenital myasthenia. So I don't think we need to stress too much on it, but I would just like to stress a couple of facts just for the interest of our residents who have joined in. So there are certain clues for congenital myasthenia. Obviously, when you have a child presenting to you with uh, ptosis and ophthalmoplegia and significant dysmorphism and proximal weakness of muscles, there is not much diagnostic confusion. Always CMS would be in your differentials. But when you don't have a patient, for, when you have an adult patient presenting with uh, uh, congenital myasthenia, the same things can be a little more uh, uh, subtle and more complex. Uh, because then you have to dig a bit further to see how long the history disease can be going on. Patient may ha might have been well adjusted and the family may not immediately be able to come up with the history of how long the disease has been going on. You cannot really fault them because if you cook a frog in a slowly boiling water, the frog doesn't realize. So the same thing. So as the disease is slowly progressing, they may not really realize or they may not be able to volunteer the onset of symptoms. So, but if you dig and keep on probing further, you may get the history that uh, disease is much more longer lasting than what it was apparently apparent initially. And then whenever you have an unresponsiveness to immunosuppressive therapy, and whenever they have a worsening or, or unresponsiveness to, to pildostigmine, always go back and question the history, question the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. We could be dealing with the congenital myasthenia and we could be adding, causing more harm than good to the patient by exposing him or her to astral cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, certain clues like repetitive CMAPs, and when in, in a um, early madam always says, in a patient who is significantly weak, uh, uh, in whom the muscle MR is completely normal, we should think of a possibility of congenital myasthenia. <laughs> there are various clinical features, clinical pointers, which will help us to uh, narrow down our differential. This can be obtained in any kind of any, any, any um, uh, review articles. So there are certain pointers which will help us to uh, direct towards a particular entity. And coming to call cue, it can have a broad range of presentation. It can be as, as significant as respiratory failure from childhood, as being having just doses, uh, especially in carrier state when it's not when it's in heterozygous. And as some corner stress can worsen things, it will res respond remarkably to salbutamol and ephedrine. So this is a flowchart which is quite useful. It came out in practical neurology, where uh, there are three conditions in which you should avoid pudostigmine at all costs. It's DOC7. Uh, call Q and the slow channel uh, and the co co constellation of slow channels so that's the CHRNA1 and B and E and uh, delta. So in these conditions, it's so the genetic testing again becomes important. So before you uh, interrogate a patient with pildostigmine, make sure that we are dealing with the right disease because things can really get out of hand. So this is a success story. This is really pleasing for all of us who are part of our management team uh, to see that the extent to which she had improved. Uh, she had a cushion guard fatigues, bilateral ptosis, on tracheostomy, on BiPAP, it's very heartening to see how she, how good she has improved. So with this, I will just uh, come to the take home points. So whenever we are faced with a refractory myasthenia gravis, also think of, we are obviously we'll be thinking of several other reasons, or, but also think of a possibility for congenital myasthenic syndrome. And always be aware of the detrimental effect of pildostigmine in such, such syndromes. And telltale pointers in history might have to be dug up, may not be always easy for and forthcoming. 
uh, of a longer duration of illness, which will help us to come to the right diagnosis. With this, I'll stop this talk and uh, I'll tag uh, Dr. Sina or I can answer, try to answer a couple of questions. Thank you, Deepak. It was a very interesting case. I mean, it's as a Excellent. clinician, it is very heartening to see, you know, some patient which is so sick. Suddenly case, right? After all, that's I mean, so for 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 decades ago, neurologists were accused of giving just B B complex and steroids. You know, it's you took very good to see patients, especially genetically diagnosed patients, improving so much, such dramatic responses. Very heartening to see. I have just one one small query. So, what happens to if how if the some of these uh, congenital myasthenic syndrome can have also have antibodies positive, right? So, how does it muddle the picture? Yeah, of course, of course. It's it. it the madam also says so. Maybe Dr. Sina can also add on to it. So, we do have from time to time see this scenario where we have uh, antibody positivity as well as uh, 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 being a, despite being a congenital myasthenia. So I am not sure I know which genetic syndrome uh, are associated with antibody. I think one couple of congenital myasthenia have this preponderance for having antibody positivity. It will model the diagnosis as well as the treatment to a great extent. I think uh, Dr. Sina, if she's around, she has some experience with it. Maybe she will be the better person to answer. Actually, we have a couple of patients. I think one was Agrin uh, who had and one another patient with cold Q who had also antibody positivity. Uh, so there are some case reports if you go through the literature also about congenital myasthenia with antibody positivity. But one of our one more thing we have to be cautious is the way of antibody testing also. Nowadays, most of the labs are doing the ELISA, which we give so much of false positivity. And when we repeat by a radio immunoassay, actually most of them are negative. So we should be very careful of the method of testing before we interpret it as. Uh, a really antibody positivity and many patients unnecessarily undergo thymectomy and all. Uh, so mm -hmm. we have to, if we are really thinking of a congenital myasthenic syndrome, better not jump into any conclusions and just start them on salbutamol, await the genetics and also repeat the antibody testing. I don't know how much both the, the second patient whom I told with cold Q, basically she also presented similar to this case with a short duration, was initially started on pyridostigmine plasma exchange. We also didn't initially think because her ACHR antibody, I think that was the COVID time when only we could do the ELISA and that showed a high titer and she worsened once pyridostigmine was started and later we revised our diagnosis. So we have to be cautious of these two factors. Yeah, I think one common question everyone is asked, uh, I think a lot of people have asked is what is the dose of fluoxetine and salbutamol? And most importantly, what till what is the maximum dose you uh, go before saying that it is ineffective? Yeah. Sinaji, you want to take the salbutamol, we usually start at 2 milligram once a day mm -hmm. and uh, keep on escalating. Uh, and uh, I, we have, I distinctly remember one patient in which, in whom, she kept on taking the pill to a maximum of 32 milligrams per day. So really? it can as go as high as that. The or even I tell 16, I think, but our patients, like Sir mentioned, are taking some of them take 24 and 32. So it depends upon how much they tolerate. But I think literature mostly tells up to 16. 16, 16. So how do you give it? I mean, how frequently you split it the dose per day? You make yes, it, it, it two, two, zero. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. twice a day or thrice a day or... Synergy, you can take this. Yeah, we split it in two doses actually. Okay. And uh, so in the morning and in the afternoon. So because mm -hmm. many of our patients do not tolerate the night doses, have tachycardia and other problems. Okay. And we go very slowly when we are escalating. Because mm -hmm. if you do a rapid escalation, many of them may have palpitations, tremor. And mm -hmm. regarding fluoxetine also, we have to start at 20 mg per day. And mm -hmm. we can slowly increase up to 80 mg per day. So, is the response dramatic or I mean, it takes some, sometimes for some patients, you have seen delayed response also. Because I remember Kadilka sir once saying that you should wait at least for a month or two before. Yeah, in that, no, I know this case, that, that patient oh. of Doc7 took at least a month to improve. But then mm -hmm. after that, quite, quite dramatic improvement. Yeah. Actually, some of our patients may report some improvement within a week and all, but actually it takes weeks and months for its effect to come. So, we have to tell the patients to be really patient. Because they will take for a few weeks until there is no effect. And the effect builds up over time. So we have to actually ask them to continue. And the effect will take actually at least one to two months maybe for a good effect to be seen. Though as we as I showed in this case, 
in the ward itself maybe in her case the periodostic mean stoppage also led to but sometimes we see in a few days itself they tell good improvement but still we have to it builds up over time yeah i think you wanted to ask you know it was a excellent case now uh, what is the clinical phenotype of truly zero 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 negative myasthenia i mean there are some uh, subsets which are which are truly truly zero negative i mean you do all three antibody antibody it will not be positive yeah. what clinical because this patient could have been passed as a zero negative myasthenia you know, absolutely absolutely see the triple negative or the quadruple negative myasthenia gravis it's, it's well described so they we do the achr then the cluster, cluster testing then the mask then the lrp4 and the agri all of them can be negative so there is no definite phenotype uh, for a triple uh, or quadruple negative but in general some reports say they are slightly milder compared to as antibody positive but it's not a, a, a generalized dic or a dictum or a rule of thumb but in general zero negative myasthenia gravis tend to be slightly better than zero positive zero positive yeah that, 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 i don't think there is any phenotypic clue for a triple negative or quadruple negative myasthenia gravis yes uh, another one which is seen in may some of the myasthenia patients is even even not even congenital in, in acquired myasthenia is also when antibody positive we see a lot of patients in the same family having antibody positivity or same family having one fam one person having thymoma not having any myasthenia other placing ha having just antibody positive have, we had a patient with some five members of the fa family who were strongly positive that is during the covid time we couldn't test anything much better so have you seen across any one family with a clustering of cases in the same family or something of that sort one issue maybe 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 because that uh, the the kind of testing that we do here it's mm -hmm. mostly elisa elisa can be false positive the one that is recommended is cell based assay mostly mm -hmm. uh, so that is could be, that could be one we have from time to time we see patients with lgmd or from done from outside being positive for us achr mm -hmm. so uh, so the false positivity is there uh, some clustering of autoimmune antibodies or, or myasthenia i have seen but i, I mm -hmm. think it's hardly Uh, can be counted in i think one or two cases of parent and the son and the ch child having mm -hmm. myasthenia so we are left scratching our heads is it really acquired or is it autoimmune or is it a case of cms plus acquired myasthenia yeah i i don't know whether having an a, a congenital myasthenia prevents a patient from developing an acquired myasthenia or not so especially so i think with the lack of time it's very interesting topic a lot of things to discuss but we have to move on so we could uh, call cena for the next talk Thank we'll you, be like, we'll welcome back deepa after this okay yeah <laughs> over to you sina yeah yeah i am just uh, starting the screen sharing so good evening all thank you for this opportunity so we had a very interesting case of a neuromuscular junction defect so now i'm going to take you through a diagnostic odc where I, i don't know whether i should tell from neuromuscular junction to muscle or rather from muscle to neuromuscular junction so here is a girl whom we evaluated who was seen in nimhans first in 2005 at the age of 13 years she presented with history of drooping of eyelids from 5 years of age and with a progressive limb girdle pattern of weakness with some fatigue from 10 years of age she also had some diurnal variation with some worsening towards the evening and just 3 months prior to presentation she started having some bulbar symptoms with dysphagia and nasal twang she was born by lscs but there was no other significant perinatal history and her development was also apparently normal she was born out of a third degree consanguineous parentage but there was no family history of any similar illness on examination she had fatigable ptosis the eye movements were restricted terminally in all the directions she had some bifacial weakness palatal movements were sluggish she had hypotony of the limbs but no selective muscle weakness muscle hypertrophy power was around grade 3 in the proximal limb muscles and mild distal weakness was present the deep tendon reflexes were sluggish so prior to presentation in nimhans she was evaluated in an outside hospital where the rns showed a decremental response in trapezius of around 15 percentage and the creatinine kinase was much elevated in 5000s and the mg was suggestive of a myopathic pattern and so she was treated as a case of congenital myasthenic syndrome was started on pyridostic mean the dose of which was gradually increased so initially she had a good response her fatigue decreased but when the dose was hiked up to 60 mg three times a day she had worsening and so the dose was again decreased 
But when the pyridostic mean was completely stopped, she used to have very significant fatigue. She used to be unable to do her activities of daily living. But if maintained on a low dose of around 60 mg, half tablet twice a day, she was maintaining well. So with this history, she came to us. So we thought whether, we also thought of possibilities, whether it could be a congenital myasthenic syndrome because of the onset from early childhood with the ptosis, and also with the significant fatigue. Other possibilities thought were like mitochondrial cytopathies, or is there any possibility of congenital myopathy, but CK was much elevated, like in thousands, or any possibility of any metabolic disorders like Pompe or any other metabolic myopathies. So the evaluation done in Nimhan showed a very high CK of about 7,000. Ammonia and lactate were elevated. The RNS was negative. Neostigmine test was negative. ACHR antibody was negative and the muscle biopsy which was done outside was reported as showing neurogenic atrophy. She was also found to have some hypothyroidism during evaluation and was started on thyroxine following which there was mild improvement in her muscle weakness and fatigue and she was continued on the small dose of pyridostigmine which she was taking. So these are her photos and videos as you can see in the upper panel she is having an asymmetrical ptosis right more than left and also there is terminal gaze restrictions and you can see that she has mild facial weakness difficulty in burying the eyelashes as well as blowing out the cheeks well so in this video which you can see you can find that the patient is having asymmetrical ptosis and also that the right eye is deviated outward she is also having fatigability the ptosis is gradually worsening as she is keeping on looking. And in the second video, you can see that her eye movements are slightly slow and also she is having terminally mild restriction of the eye movement in the horizontal gaze. And in the third video, you can see that the patient has ptosis as well as she is having limb fatigue. So you can find that at the end of around 20 to 30 seconds, she is unable to hold up the arm abducted and she has significant limb fatigue. So further testing of this patient, in 2016, she had underwent a targeted panel for CMS from an outside hospital, which was negative. In 2018, she had undergone a whole mitochondrial genome sequencing, which was again negative. And in 2019, a clinical exome which was done in outside lab as well as which was done on a project basis from uh, abroad which also showed a heterozygous variant, a duplication in the DOC7. So a single variant that was reported as of uncertain significance. So we also couldn't proceed any further at that point of time. So we just continued her own pyridostigmine, asked her to take salbutamol, but she was lost for follow-up for some time, and I think she didn't take salbutamol. So when we were stuck up with this patient, with these findings, which I initially mentioned, we had two other patients who had similar presentation. Both were men. So the initial first patient was born out of consanguineous parentage, but the next two were of non-consanguineous parentage. The second patient presented at 22 years of age and the third one at 16 years of age. Both had onset around 1 to 2 years of age with history of delayed motor milestones. They had a similar presentation to our first case with ptosis, ophthalmoparesis, bulbar symptoms, facial weakness, fatigable limb weakness. And the third patient even had contractures and also mild uh, calf hypertrophy was present. So it was interesting that none of these patients had any cardiac involvement, but the CK was much elevated in thousands. And the decrement done in these other two patients also showed positive of around 15 to 16 percentage in the quadriceps. And the muscle biopsy, which was done outside in the third patient, was reported as muscular dystrophy, but we didn't have any slides for review. And the second patient had initial good improvement with pyridostigmine and salbutamol, similar to the first case. And he, he was able to maintain well for an year, but the effect gradually waned. So even in the first case, though she had initially good improvement with pyridostigmine and she was maintaining okay for three years, but at the end of three years, her effect of pyridostigmine started to come down. And also 
both these patients lost their ambulation, the first one by around 21 years of age and the second by around 24 years of age. And while the third patient didn't report any improvement with pyridosigmine and salbutamol. So here we have three cases. What is interesting in all of them is the characteristic onset, childhood onset, limb girdle pattern of weakness with fatigue and also with ptosis of thalmaparesis and bulbar symptoms and also with CK being much elevated. So we thought of a neuromuscular junction involvement also possible, but the CK was much elevated. The muscle biopsies were inconclusive. And so we didn't know what actually each one of them had. So this is the third patient, second patient. You can see that he has got his abelian habitus. He has got again ptosis. He has got muscle wasting as well as limb fatigue is seen. And he had a decremental response. And this is the third patient. So you can see that he, even he has got significant uh, ptosis and he has got ophthalmoparesis, restricted gaze in all the directions. So here we have three patients who presented in a similar manner. So would anybody like to give any opinions? What could be the possible diagnosis in this case? If not, I would like I will move forward if you have any opinions because we also didn't know what these three patients had. So any opinions about the diagnosis? So I think if there are no responses, maybe I'll move forward. So the diagnosis was difficult in these cases. As I mentioned, the first patient, the clinical exome was inconclusive. It showed only a heterozygous variant in the DOC7 and the whole exome sequencing in the second and third patient also didn't yield any confirmatory diagnosis. And the muscle biopsy, as I mentioned, for the first patient showed neurogenic atrophy. For the third patient, it was reported as muscular dystrophies, but we didn't have the tissues for any re-evaluation. So at the same time, our geneticists uh, had reanalyzed the raw data of these patients, but and he had found a mutation in the intron 5, a splicet mutation in the intron 5 of the desmin gene, which was homozygous, but it was reported as uncertain significance because of lack of other literature correlation and the phenotypic presentation with uh, fatigue and limb girdle pattern of weakness with predominant fatigue and neuromuscular junction defect also being suspected showing significant decrement also. So how did we later come to a diagnosis of these patients? So this that exome that of the patient two and three were later reanalyzed along with the other unsolved neuromuscular disease patient in the RD Connect platform, the genome phenome analysis platform through SOLVRD project. So in these two patients also, it was a similar intronic variant at five nucleotides downstream was detected. And so when a similar variant was detected, so it led to the uh, review and comparison of clinical data of patients with these same mutation was checked for. So we did therefore a fresh muscle biopsy in the patient too, which was evaluated histopathologically as well as by RNA analysis and Western blood to see whether the genotype genotyping fits in. So what started in 2019, it started way back in 2005 and later with the genetics, which we did from 2019, initially what was thought of as a homozygous variant of uncertain significance in the Desmin gene in 2020, 2021, through the Solvardi reanalysis, we could identify the same variants in the patients, to second and third patient. And so we proceeded for a reverse phenotyping as well as pathotyping and as well as we used other methods like in silico splicing analysis as well as the functional validation to see whether this uh, genetic problem can be solved. So this is the muscle biopsy of the second patient. As you can see, the first one is a hematoxylin eosin stain, which is showing the myopathic features. You can see some variation in the fiber size. You can see internalized nuclei and you can find some hyaline changes and myofibrillar disarray. This is the NADS stain, which is showing the presence of hypo as well as hyperstained areas, which are suggestive of myofibrillar disarray. This is MGT stain, which is showing the presence of some rim vacuoles, internalized nuclei. And also this is the desmin immunostaining, which was showing the absent staining in the sarcoplasm with some subsarcolamal aggregates, which are seen showing a partial loss of desmin. So what did we do further? So we did an in silico splicing analysis so this particular variation in the intron 5 
was predicted by the splicing site prediction tools to disrupt the canonical don donor splicing site. And usually, this kind of new changes can be affected with an, uh, it may be associated with exon skipping. But sometimes instead of the exon being deleted, we can also have an intron being retained. So in this particular case, so the intron 5 retention may have happened. It was, which, which can result in incorporation of a premature stop codon, in, resulting in the incorporation of 27 new amino acids between the exon 5 and 6, but resulting in a truncated protein and the last four exons are lost. So by the in silico splicing analysis losing the splice A, which is a widely used machine learning in silico tool for splicing analysis, it was found that this affects the donor splice site at the exon 5, intron 5 boundary, but it was not causing any effect on the upstream acceptor site in the intron 4 or in the exon 5 boundary. So usually if it is exon skipping, as we told, either it can be exon skipping or it can be an intron retention. So if it's an exon skipping which has happened, it is predicted to cause loss of both donor as well as acceptor site, which is associated with an exon. Because here there was lack of upstream effect, it was thought that it could be an intron retention which can happen. And it, it can be leaky splice site effect, which can cause a variable phenotype presentation as well as partial desmin expression, which by which can cause a milder phenotype as well as variable phenotypic presentation. So we did the RT-PCR as well as the Western blot using the muscle tissue from the second patient to confirm this defect. So this is the RT-PCR of the muscle RNA from the patient too. So here we have got three primers, the exon 3 to 8, 4 to 8 and 3 to 4. So between this 3 to 4, we can find that the patient as well as that of the control, the human myoblast control, we can find that there is normal staining and single band which is seen. Whereas between exon 3 to 8 and 4 to 8, we can find that the rest of the patient has got two faint bands. The normal control has got a single properly stained band. These two faint bands are corresponding to one with the normal transcript, which is reduced in expression. And the other one is the abnormal transcript, which is of a longer one with the intron retention. So this shows that this is a leaky splice site with intron retention, resulting in partial desmin expression. There is nonsense mediated decay, and there is partial loss of desmin in the muscle biopsy, and this is associated with a milder phenotype. So we did the nested PCR as well as the Western blot also. So in this nested PCR, we can see that uh, with this primer for exon 4 to 7, we can find again this black arrow, which is showing the abnormal transcript with the full in inclusion of the full intron 5. And in the Western blot, compared with the control, we can see that the desmin expression is reduced. The normal desmin expression is reduced in the patient too. So finally, so with these various methods of RT-PCR, the muscle histopathology, as well as the Western blotting, we could correlate the genetic change which we identified as causative of the disease process. And so what was labeled as a variant of uncertain significance was now labeled as a likely pathogenic variant. So coming to a brief discussion about the desminopathies. So desminopathies, as we all know, have a highly variable spectrum. So it can present with only skeletal myopathy, cardiomyopathy, or rarely as a congenital myasthenic syndrome-like presentation with a neuromuscular junction defect. Predominantly, they cause autosomal dominant, associated with autosomal dominant inheritance and desmin positive aggregates. And also, but recessive phenotypes are rare, and it can be associated with the loss of desmin. So neuromuscular junction involvement has been reported rarely and also especially with recessive desmin null phenotype. Though more than 120 mutations have been described, the CMS kind of presentation has been described previously only only two patients. But here we are reporting three patients from South India who were found to have this homozygous intronic desmin mutation with a unique phenotype of myopathy, mitobular myopathy and overlapping with the congenital myasthenic syndrome kind. So this mean what is its role? So it has a very important, it's an important intermediate filament protein. It has a very important role in the maintenance of the myofibrillar network. As you can see, this does mean it is connecting between the sarcolemma, the nucleus, the mitochondria, etc. So it has a very important role interlinking these structures. It has varied functional role in myogenesis. 
It modulates cell adhesion and migration. So it's also found in the postsynaptic membrane of the human neuromuscular junction. So it plays a very important role in maintaining the structural and the functional integrity of the neuromuscular junction. And because the human tissue studies are very difficult and tissues are not readily available. So there have been studies in Desmin knockout mice which have shown that there is fragmentation of the neuromuscular junction in these mice, as well as increased transcription levels of ACHR, especially the ACHR gamma unit, which is showing increased regeneration. So these are how in the comparison of the wild type and the mutant, the Desmin knockout mice, in which we can find that the fragmented uh, neuromuscular junctions are more in the case of Desmin knockout mice, especially if you see the soleus muscle and sensor digitorum longus in which these studies can be done, especially it is much more in the soleus muscle. So autosomal dominant one sites I mentioned are more common. They usually present with a distally predominant weakness. They can present sometimes as isolated cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic or erythromogenic myopathies, cardiomyopathies, and they can also present as autosomal recessive with the dilated cardiomyopathy. So Desmin has got a varied range of presentation can have as a myofibrillar myopathy, as a neurogenic scapuloperoneal syndrome, as a lingardial muscular dystrophies. Why this pleiotropy and why this phenotypic variability? That is because of the broad expression in the different organs. So the different mechanisms of the nonsense mediated decay, the gene dosage effect, the modifier genes, various factors may be contributing to this pleiotropic effect. So, but what about the recessive ones? The autosomal dominant have a, a later onset, whereas the recessive ones are rare and they present early, but can have a variable onset from infancy to adult. And the limb weakness can also be variable. They can be proximodistal. Cardiac involvement can be there in 40 to 45 percent days, but the disease progression may be more rapid and they have an early death from cardiorespiratory complications. But despite Desmin being implicated in the maintenance of the neuromuscular junction, so the clinical involvement, which is suggestive like a fatigue and neuromuscular junction defects, has not been reported much in autosomal dominant desminopathies. So these are the various Desmin mutations which have been identified. So Desmin has got an alpha helical rod structure. So as we can see for alpha helical rod structure with the three linkers in between and a head and a tail, and so here, actually, most of these mutations are affecting mainly the 2B coil. And we can find, so each of these mutations which cause particular manifestations like dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, all these are labeled in different colors. So you can see in the more common ones, it can be more of dilated cardiomyopathies or myofibrillar myopathies or sometimes as dysmenopathy related mutations. So there is a wide variety of presentation which they can have. So there have been only... Uh, uh, one paper which reported a similar presentation like in our case, that was by Dermas et al. So he reported two cousins with myopathy CMS phenotype. So this was one of the patients who was having a decremental response of around 14 percentage in ADM, APB, etc. You can see that he also has got doses of thalmoparesis, elongated face, and also the significant bifacial weakness, scoliosis. You can see the contractures which are seen, in the lean habitus. And also, however, this patient later developed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and respiratory involvement, and he expired at the age of 17 years, whereas his cousin who was reported was maintaining well on salbutamol, was maintaining better on salbutamol therapy without any evidence of uh, cardiomyopathy. And however, the genetic mutation in these patients were different from that was seen in our case. It was a duplication in the exon 1. So these are the muscle biopsies from these two patients. Which shows, which shows the presence of the dysmorphic internal nuclei in the hematocyl neosin and the MGT stains. And also we can find various internal, internalized nuclei as well as this is the desmin staining, which is showing the absent staining in the patients as compared to that of the controls. And these are the electron microscopic uh, pictures, which are showing the disorganization of the myofibrillar uh, filaments. And also here we can find the autophagic vacuoles as well as abnormal branch mitochondria, which can be seen. So recessive desminopathies, as I told, are very rare, present as a severe early onset myopathy. But here we present a recessive form with milder phenotype in three unrelated patients from Southern India. The characteristic feature being childhood onset, gradual progression, fatigable limb girdle weakness, ptosis, bulbar involvement, and the highlight was absence of cardiac involvement also as majority of these desminopathies can have cardiac involvement. The CK was much elevated in thousands and the RNA showed significant decrement in all these cases. 
and the clinical improvement was noted initially, at least temporarily, with pyridocycline and salbutamol in two cases. And all the three patients had homozygous substitution in the intron 5, causing a donor spliceite defect. And the muscle biopsy was also showing myopathy with myofibrillar disarray, lack of desmin staining. And we confirmed our diagnosis with Western blot as well as the RT-PCR. Western blot showing the reduced desmin and the RT-PCR showing the presence of two transcripts, reduced normal desmin transcript as well as an abnormal lengthy transcript with in inclusion of the intron 5. And the sequencing also confirmed the inclusion of the intron 5 in the longer transcript. So this provides evidence of a leaky splicite mutation, which is causing a partial loss of desmin and resulting in an CMS myopathy overlap phenotype. So this less severe phenotype expands the spectrum of desminopathies. So it shows the presence of CMS neuromuscular junction involvement, and also they had some response to treatment. So this CMS phenotype might be an underdiagnosed entity because many a times they present with severe weakness, early fatality, and early identification is very important of this phenotype because they may have some response to ACH inhibitors as well as salbutamol. And the presence of this rare novel intronic variant in three unrelated patients from Southern India might be suggesting a possible founder haplotype, but at this stage, we are not able to comment further. And many times the syntronic variants which are affecting the splicite may be classified as a variant of uncertain significance in routine diagnostic testing. So we have to reevaluate with regard to what is the effect of this splicing and we need the functional studies. And this study also highlights the importance of reverse phenotyping, reverse pathotyping in this era of genetics. So while most of these recessive mutations can result in total absence of protein, here there was a partial expression resulting in a milder phenotype. So this case highlights the long journey sometimes which we may have to undertake to come to a definite diagnosis, as well as the need for reverse pathotyping, phenotyping, as well as the need for collaborative studies in this era of genetics. So my heartfelt gratitude to my mentor, Professor Nalini Madam, who has been our guiding force and inspiration. Special thanks to Dr. Kiran, who was who did a PhD with Madam. He's a geneticist. His PhD was on Duchenne muscular dystrophy genetics. He's an excellent geneticist now. He's working in Ontario. And under Professor Hans Lokmuller and the team of the Soul RD project, without which we could not have come to a definitive diagnosis in these cases. So this is our neuromuscular disorder team of NIMHANS, and this is Dr. Kiran out here. And this is Dr. Prithish also, who was Madam's PhD student, the entire neuromuscular team collaborating with various departments in the NIM hands. Thank you all for the patient listening. Amazing case, Dr. Sina. So, so difficult to diagnose in a long journey and you all persisted and ultimately the patient was diagnosed. An excellent case. Vishnu, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a classic case of, uh, I mean, it's a long journey and doing functional validation and finding out a new mutation and uh, it's a long journey, right? I mean, you need, you need the setup to do this. My, my only query was, uh, was segregation done for this patient? What did the segregation show? Uh, so the segregation analysis... I don't have, uh, I think those first patient was lost for follow-up, so we didn't do hers. So I think okay. in this case, we went in a reverse manner. So at that okay. point, we couldn't do it initially. Okay. Something I think we had, but later send the samples to abroad, but I'm not sure of those reports actually. Okay. So many, it's now, uh, see, it's now the, uh, you know, in, in the last WMS uh, debate also, it was where muscle biopsy was genetics first. So, the ultimately solution was biopsy has become a functional study and functional validation protocol, right? It's it's good to pursue it. I mean, that's, I mean, uh, patient has done underwent targeted testing multiple times. He had a targeted CMS testing, he had a clinical exome. I mean, it requires a, a, a clinical, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, the case shows the importance of a clinician in it. It's very easy to give up at one point of time that you did a genetics, didn't pick up something and give up. So once you have a clinical uh, acumen to, to persist, then only this will come up because and no genetist is going to pick up just because uh, you write one word diagnosis and send it to only the clinician keeps on persisting if such a clinical diagnosis. 
then only it can come up but uh, i mean desmin and i didn't i didn't know that such a case previously also was reported in neurology but it is a it is just completely new information for me that desmin can present as neuromuscular junction defect yeah it was actually really dr kiran <laughs> who went through the raw data so yeah. a clinician's feedback as well as the geneticist who goes through the raw data meticulously and keep looking whether and he i think found out a similar presentation in that report and he picked it yeah. up Yeah, that I mean we keep saying the word deep phenotyping, right? So, yeah. so the deep phenotyping usually happens usually in the reverse setup. Rather, when we get the thing and go back and then phenotype again, then much more deeper phenotype and the much more family history. You dug up a lot of things once we have something in there. So uh, let's go to further because we have short of time. So which uh, though we have very interesting uh, case, we have you know? Dr. Murthy sir and yeah. Dr. Dr. Sudhan sir. Sir, can we have your comments? Sir? Dr. Murthy sir is there and Dr. Madhu Sudhan. I think. Uh, Are they there in the panelists? I don't think so, sir. They're not in the panelists. Is there? Yeah, oh, just, oh, just now they have been added. <laughs> I think so. Ah, Murthy sir is there. Anyway, we can we can go ahead. We will ask sir for his comments at the end. Okay, so, so Deepak, so let's go to the last case. Okay. Okay. So again. Um, yeah, we can thanks. see your slide and we can uh, hear hear you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, after that excellent case discussion by Sinaji, I will just quickly give one short case, but it is uh, equally interesting, I believe. So let's see. So this was an unusual case of iron doping. That's the title I have given. Um, it's not as straightforward as that. So we have a twenty-five year old man with normal birth and development. With uh, presenting to us with uh, chief complaints of weakness of left lower limb for nine months, followed by weakness of right lower limb for one month, and weakness of left upper limb for a period of one month. Quickly going through the history, his complaints started with left ankle twisting, uh, with the uh, uh, loosening of the, uh, footwear with awareness. Uh, he used to have left knee buckling, which progressively made his walking difficult. He used to have uh, uh, um, frequent started having frequent give away at the knee and uh, falling down. And also started having trouble going um, up and down stairs, which kept on getting worse uh, to such an extent that over the seven months uh, period, he started requiring a cane for uh, amputation. And uh, one month prior to admission, he started having uh, uh, sinister symptoms in the right lower limb as well, which made him really anxious. And along the same time, he also started having left hand symptoms. Initially, some dexterity issue with the left hand, but soon had proximal left upper limb weakness as well. All this over a period of nine months time. He uh, also noticed a dreaded uh, sign of uh, progressive thinning of muscles of the left lower limb, and also along with twitching. This time it was confined. Uh, at that time it was confined to the left lower limb alone, and he started having progressive exertional fatigue. Interestingly, he was told to have drooping of both eyelids for a long time, which of course, which uh, in fact was not much of an issue for him except for the cosmetic reasons. But his friends have been telling him that he has been having drooping of eyelids, but. Uh, the fact is that never became that prominent enough to cover his eyes uh, to become a major issue for him. But it was quite uh, evident on uh, interview uh, by looking at his face and on probing, he told it was there for quite a while. Um, uh, but it was not really a, a trouble for him. Uh, to keep it short, there were no other sensory motor or cranial bulbar symptoms, and uh, apparently there were no similar illness in the family. <clears throat> on examination, we can the, we can see the ptosis, maybe not. Uh, Very prominent in this uh, photograph, but take my word for it, he had significant doses bilaterally, uh, not complete but mild to moderate, and it was asymmetrical and fluctuating and fatigue. His extraocular movements were normal. Uh, the rest of the cranial nerves were normal. Uh, no telltale evidence for a wasting of tongue or a brisk jaw jerk or an element or human facial palsy. None of that was there. Only this doses was evident, and then wasting was quite significant. So it was there both in the predominant in the left leg, uh, in the thighs, in the calves, and in the feet. uh the um and then he had hypotonia the tone was uh, uh, normal to hypotonia there were no umn signs so this is the power charting so mostly you can see the the brunt of the disease has been uh, has fallen on the left leg which was significantly weak he could hardly make any meaningful movement the left leg by the time of presenting to us he had involvement of the right and uh, right lower limb and the left upper limb uh, asymmetrically proximally mm. uh, while the right upper limb seemed to be spared The deep temporal reflex were uh, uh, elicitable. It was 
keeping in parallel with the degree of weakness, it was uh, not more or not less, it, it, it was sort of matching. I mean to say there are no clear human sets, uh, to put it very bluntly. And here, fatigable weakness, in a limb, in a weak muscle, I understand it's not very easy to come in on fatigability, but the right upper limb, which was pretty strong, uh, was having fatigable weakness, which I will show. And the sensory examination was normal. So this is the video which I have intentionally kept black, uh, a bit dark. So, uh, let me see whether I can play. Okay, sorry for that. I'm not going to waste any time. But on the right side, which was five out of five power, after holding him for just a period of ten seconds, uh, his hand would slowly drop, and his face was you could, you could really see the effort that he was putting in try to keep the arm up, which was strong. So that is some clue that there might be some amount of fatigability happening on the right side. Why should it be there? We'll soon unravel. On the left side, the left upper limb was significantly weak. So that kind of fatigability does not make much sense to do a fatigability test on a significantly weak limb. But the other limb was showing fatigability to go along with his fatigable ptosis. And his initially the bystander was his brother, but soon one, one day, one day his mother also came to visit him in the ward. And then we picked up this very interesting point. His mother, this are the middle two are his mothers taken at different time points. They show significant ptosis. Again, the lady was quite uh, uh, um, bothered, uh, unbothered. I mean, she doesn't give mind much about that. Is how she has been for a long time. Doesn't really bother her much. But this ptosis was seen much more significantly in her mother. And this is the maternal uh, uncle, that is uh, the lady's uh, one of the siblings. And he is also having mild ptosis. <clears throat> so this was, uh, uh, although at first glance, there was no involvement of similar phenotype in the family. This is some telltale clue that it is not something which we maybe. Uh, uh, running in the family, maybe. So to summarize, we have a 25-year-old male with progressive asymmetric LMN weakness of limb, which is uh, 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 proximal than distal to start up. And there was no, there were no definite human signs. Uh, ptosis with fatigability with family history of ptosis. That was what was really confirmed together, bewildering all of us. So, uh, so what does it really point to? So obviously, it's not that difficult. If you keep aside the ptosis and the family history of ptosis. It seems to be a case of an anterior horn cell disease. Uh, there was no history of polio in the childhood, uh, um, uh, just to make uh, make things clear. Uh, the anterior horn cell disease seems to be the first in the list. And uh, a remote possibility of MMCB can be considered at least theoretically, but uh, the fact is it started in the lower limb. This is keeping aside the ptosis. But the thing is, what about the fatigable ptosis and the family history of ptosis? How do you fit that into the whole picture? So thinking from the other end, so are we dealing with some kind of myasthenia, myasthenia gravis? So could it, we have seen patients with mass myasthenia having weakness or wasting distally, uh, but this kind of wasting and weakness seem to be quite profound. So I don't, I mean, it's, that's it's another point. So can, could it be some congenital myasthenia like earlier we saw certain congenital myasthenia like slow channel syndromes can have distal weakness, like a finger extensor weakness can be there uh, and some kind of wasting as well. But this kind of wasting and this kind of diffuse and significant presentation with the wasting and element signs seem to be odd. Or could we just be dealing with a sporadic case of an MND with an incidental ptosis? But the fact, what do, how do you explain the family history of ptosis? How do you explain the, fat, uh, the fluctuation? So it was not all fitting well smoothly. So we could explain bits and pieces, but not the whole syndrome totally. So did the examination after the investigation, did it help us much? So the NCS snaps were normal. Uh, the RNS did show decrement. You can see the uh, decrement, but uh, there is some finding which is uh, a bit uh, standing out, which I'll probably come to reveal later on. Karna showed decrement from deltoid and trapezius. The EMG did show innervation from cervical and lumbar sacral segment, so, but not from thoracic or the uh, cranial bulbar segment. The antibodies were negative. Uh, the CK was like on the higher side. The, the myositis panel was negative. By the time he came to us, he had undergone both, both nerve and muscle biopsy. Both showed features clearly of a neurogenic process, showed chronic axonopathy and uh, chronic neurogenic changes. And the rest were non contributory So again, we are coming back to a possible young onset ALS. So uh, that is one. So the, I forgot to mention the plantar were equivocal. That is the only evidence of a uh, UMN. There was otherwise no evidence of UMN. So could it, are we dealing with the young onset ALS? But what about again the fatigable ptosis and the fluctuating ptosis and the fatigability on the right side kept on uh, confronting us. So we sent the genetics for the patient. And this is what we got. We got a <clears throat> uh, pathogenic uh, heterozygous variant in uh, FUS gene at exon 50. So how to make sense of this? So just let quickly, just in the next five minutes, I'll quickly summarize and try to make a sense of what all this means. 
So FES, uh, um, it is a highly complex uh, mechanism. It mainly deals with the uh, transportation of mRNA from the nucleus to cytoplasm. To keep things simple, uh, FUS mutation finally result in uh, uh, axonal injury and uh, cell death. Uh, FUS is 4% uh, of familiar, constitutes 4% of familiar and 1% of sporadic ALS. The clinical phenotype is such that it usually affects younger uh, around a couple of decades earlier compared to sporadic uh, uh, ALS. Uh, younger age of around mean, mean, uh, late mid 30s, late 30s to early 40s. The characteristic phenotype is that of a rapid progression with a poor prognosis and predominantly element like in our patient, but onset is supposed to be more common in the cervical segment. The cognition is generally preserved, but in rapidly progressive conditions, cognition can also be involved. But uh, the same variant has been reported previously in uh, 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 ALS, but none of the reports uh, have shown uh, a case, uh, a doses, reported doses. How do you explain? So then we, this is one possibility. This, we are not sure that we are, uh, we are hitting the, the nail on the head. This is one of the possibilities. So role of NMJ in ALS is nothing new, but it has been doing the circle since academic discussion for quite a while now. So we all know about the dying forward hypothesis where the, leash, where the, where the injury starts in the motor um, uh, axon, uh, anterior horn cells in the brain and the spinal cord and the disease sort of spreads down. That is what we call the dying forward hypothesis. But there is also this theory of dying back hypothesis where everything starts at the neuromuscular junction. So this is one important, interesting paper that was authored, co-authored by uh, Madam Gauri Devi, uh, which has come out recently. Very interesting reading. I strongly, strongly recommend uh, uh, all of the viewers to uh, go through it if possible. So paper argues along with numerous other articles which have come in the past, one, uh, past decade or so, that the pathological changes may be starting at the other end. So maybe it may be starting at the neuromuscular junction and this is slowly creeping up. There are several animal models, including FUS, which prominently describes a neuromuscular junction disorder in animal models of uh, ALS. This is an example of a mouse model and a human model, which shows that ALS in, in, neuro, in, in ALS, neuromuscular junctions can be abnormal. There's a clear alteration in the morphology of the neuromuscular junction disorder, the junction. junction. And it's postulated that the neuromuscular junctions can start in the, I mean, the, the degeneration start in the NMJ and then goes to the axon and then to the motor neuron and can see, sort of sort of creep up uh, back uh, rather than about downwards. So coming back to our patient, we were not really sure. So this is one possibility we are thinking because on the, the, the fact is the patient has got an FUS ALS. Uh, and the fact is that he has got a fluctuating ptosis which runs in the family. So how do we, this is one possibility we have tried to explain, but uh, I'm not sure we are, we are all welcome to contribute. So he was started on, he had always received a course of steroid from outside with no improvement. He was tried on pildostrepin and salbutamol with hardly any significant improvement. He had one more follow-up at six months in which his disease was significantly progressing. We recently tried and contacted him, but unfortunately we could not contact him. So uh, take home message, we have seen a case of uh, congenital myasthenia. We have seen a case of desminopathy presenting with ptosis. Could it be that the anterior horn cell also can cause fluctuating ptosis? I'm just putting it as a hypothesis. Not, uh, uh, I, I don't want the residents to say that anterior horn cell disease is one of the causes for fluctuating ptosis. Uh, again, the family history and the examination gives plenty of clues. So uh, they may not be able to know significance as we have kept on saying from time and time again. Uh, the, the family history may not be the same phenotype as that of the proband. So we need to examine the family. So that is what was a real, real eye, eye, eye opener in this case. So NMJ as possible site of pathology in ALS is something which we also need to be cognizant of. And uh, with that, I will stop now. I think I'm sure there are several questions in the group. Uh, I will try to, me and Sina will try to answer these questions if you need. I'll stop now. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, it was a very provocative, <laughs> pro provocative discussion of uh, doses in uh, ALS as uh, uh, this one. So it was. Uh, Deepak, he think... had any dementing uh, uh, features also? No, sir. He was well preserved. What was the age age of the patient? Twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. So we will have a very prominent, I think, rapidly progressive young onset FTDs with a quadrate atrophy. Exactly. So exon 14 and 15, uh, exon 15 is mostly with uh, uh, ALS phenotype, but 14 is more with FTLD. Okay. And then they can have an overlap also, FTLD and uh, ALS also. You're right, sir. But in this patient, our patient was cognitively well preserved. Could it this be a double trouble? Yeah, so <laughs> tell me, spell it out more. So what kind of double are you talking about? <laughs> you, have, you have ALS, then 
I think, sir, you are mute. I think. I mean, we can't hear you. It's unmute. In fact, it shows. Yeah, yeah, we can hear now. We can hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, in some time back, about three years back, in the one of the IAN grand rounds, I presented a case of uh, motor neuron disease, clearly with fatigable weakness, positive RNS, and ultimately turned out to be auditable dementia with ALS. Mm-hmm. So I had another patient also. Even in literature says that ALS can have. positive awareness and fatigability can be present mm-hmm. so that is that is i think it's not an uncommon phenomena uh, even electrophysiologically also there is fatigability is there now i have one basic question to all of you we are not know much about it how does this salbutamol and fluoxetine work in this kind of sort of congenital myasthenic syndrome anyone can any explain one of my students asked me i do not know how to answer that question can you help me in uh, finding it then Uh, yeah, I can try. So, salbutamol. The obviously the exact action we don't know yet. But salbutamol, yeah. what it does is that it will stabilize the the neuromuscular tissue. Is what is said in the case of salbutamol. In fluoxetine, usually uh, the it's given in slow channel syndrome where the ca- channel channel kinetics is such that uh, the uh, the channel will be kept in an active state for a long time. So it is uh, acting much longer than the channel is open for much longer time than it should be. The fluoxetine sort of like uh, uh, corrects this disparity and shifts the balance towards uh, closing the channel. Okay, thank you, thank you, Deepak. Uh, if I may, little add on to this last case. So this patient basically, it was not just the mother and the one maternal uncle. Actually, multiple family members. The uh, actually, these both came to the hospital for a uh, to visit the patient, but multiple maternal uncles were also having tosis. and this patient actually in the ward he had a good response to paradoxetamine and salbutamol actually he came in a wheelchair and he was walking in the ward so we were actually really happy thinking it is a congenital myasthenic syndrome his lactate was somewhere 60 so later uh, we reviewed actually the literature there is one case report of fus which is with tosis i don't remember the exact mutation but it is a different mutation from our patient so that's also a, a 21 year old lady who had presented with some tosis as well as cl- classical picture of als otherwise with tosis and on follow up she was even having slow eye movements saccades were all very slow so it can happen so if you as with tosis has been reported before and like um, the sudan sir likely mentioned fatigue is very common in neuromuscular junction i mean in als patients as well as even decremental response can be there but what maybe misled us a little or made us happy thinking his uh, little improvement was the tosis and especially in multiple family members so these are rare presentations like deepak sir told the students needn't be carried away thinking tosis and fluctuations are a feature of als but they do happen these are the rarer phenotypes so and this patient in the last follow up i think and this fus progresses fairly rapidly so i think within one year of onset within a few months after he left here his uh, he was put on non invasive ventilation uh, that was nearly 2 3 years back so i don't know the latest follow up like sir told. Thank you. Just would like to quickly add to one of the points. So ALS, I mean, uh, Andre Onsel, uh, fatigability clinically and electrophysiologically is well well described. Up to seventy percent of ALS patients can have a RNS decrement. But the thing is, if you that typical envelope shape of recovery with ten stimulus will not be seen. And usually, will not be seen in ALS. That is one point to distinguish. But even other SFEMG obviously can be abnormal. I RNS, think it was there. Yeah. It was there in your RNST, which you showed also. No, uh, I don't. Was, I think it was. Uh, it was not a typical U. It was. It was not a typical U. That was what I was trying. So that typical U, where it recovers towards the end of stimulus, is typical of neuromuscular. While in case of my muscle or an anterior muscle, the typical U will not be seen. And then we also have reported a couple of cases where there are significant extracranial ophthalmoplegia in patients with ALS. So it's all these outliers are known to occur in clinical neurology from time to time. We don't. We fail to explain all the times. Even in that, in that, not necessarily ophthalmoplegia, those patients can have gaze palsy also. 
In fact, I got a FTD with case policy. We still thought of them to hear, but the Oplak affair was intact in that patient. Mm -hmm. At least now in the era of genetics, I think we are now at least have answers. Previously, we used to have, we used to don't have answers. Now we at least have answers to most of this. And I think we will see such outliers much more in future because of extensive genetic testing, which is now being available very commonly. And thanks for and our, our today's meeting was special because Muslims are also there. <laughs> so thank, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so I am here to learn from you, not <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so I think I don't. I, I was not even born when you started teaching. So that's uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. So Deepak was also a student. Yeah, I, I had a good fortune to. How to say so? No, 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 no. The, the fortune is other way around. It's my own fortune. <laughs> we got you as your teacher. Thank you, sir. So I think we can. Uh, we are uh, overshoot by around fifteen minutes, but that's okay. It's a good discussion that happened. So thanks for everyone for joining. Rajesh, sir, you want to have some final words? <laughs> Yeah, I guess that is there. I think he is not there. I don't think he, I think he left. I don't know. Okay. Thanks everyone. So next, after two months, we can see again. Next is Ames' turn. That's our turn. So we'll, <laughs> so that's the last of this year's uh, um, session. So next year, we'll come up with a similar more. We'll try to increase the participation from more centers. The uh, Ideally, our concept was that uh, neuromuscular field uh, gets more participation for the subsection also and uh, and gets wider reach across india and so we'll try and give more opportunities to other centers to participate other than the ones which participate in this this year uh, participate so let's hope that uh, we have much more interesting things to learn with so next end of december uh, we'll see with the uh, aims presenting our uh, um, it's our turn to present Thank Marissa, you. Please, please join next time as well and ask some tough questions to me. <laughs> so yeah, you're always welcome. Diva, Diva, Diva has to pay back to me. So you, <laughs> so you, so thank you everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, Sina. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.